I'll quote the words of the Syrophoenician woman when she came to Jesus on behalf of her vexed daughter. Jesus refused to hear her. She came, the Bible says, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She worshipped. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, beginning at verse 5, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. 9 says, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And the conversation goes on. Jesus talks to her about the gift of God. Verse 11, discuss the de depth of the well. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Some kind of a promise. They continue the discourse and the conversation gets around to this business of worshipping. In verse 20, it seems to me like the woman is more or less defensive. She is saying, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. He said, Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. It was a slap in the face to her. He goes on to say, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In the book of Hebrews, great hall of fame for the faithful, chapter 11, verse 21 says, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff, Last night, some of you found out you were more powerful than you thought you were. People receive the Holy Ghost all over this auditorium, not particularly by my hands, but by the laying on of your hands. People were healed in this place last night, not particularly because I laid hands upon them, but because you laid hands upon them. Ministering is part of the key to revival and to an explosion of signs, wonders, and miracles. But there's another aspect of this that is equally important. It has to do with what we call worship, or I would rather term it our approach unto God. The way we approach Him has everything to do with everything. How we come into His gates and how we enter into His courts. And I want to talk to you tonight about our approach unto God. He is already here. And because Jesus is here, anything can happen. Anything. Anything. Say anything. Say, I believe it. Say, I want it. And I will receive it. Let us pray together, lifting our hands in the sanctuary of the Lord. Lord Jesus, tonight, 
We have come to this place in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This man from Galilee to whom we have given our allegiance. We come tonight to this sacred desk, O oh Lord, to impart. O oh Lord, understanding, let it be so. Revelation, let it be so. Let the gift of faith operate freely in this place. Angels, O oh Lord, being released to minister to those who have needs in their bodies, in their minds, in their souls. Let the visitor among us be converted to the glory and to the power of this great and glorious truth. We have come tonight to worship you in spirit and in truth, making no apology to anybody, but doing the thing that we know to do that pleaseth thee. O Holy Father, in the name of Jesus, we commend this service into your hands. Anoint these lips of clay. Cause us to do the thing that you would have us to do. We will not fail to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We ask these things in Jesus' matchless name and for his sake. And everyone said, Amen. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing so long. Would you... In addition to clapping tonight, also shout with your voice. It's something that David taught us to do. Would you clap and at the same time shout with your voice for just a moment? Oof. going for just a moment. Just keep that going for just a moment. There is something that is building. We've all done our thing, but there is something now that the Spirit of God wants to do in this place. Suddenly, the Lord will come to His temple. Suddenly! In the name of Jesus! Hallelujah! Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. It is in an atmosphere like this that people can leap out of wheelchairs and throw down crutches. Tumors disappear. Limbs grow. Spines straighten. Minds clear. Devils go running away. Angels come leaping for joy in the presence of the Lord where there is liberty. Paul! Hallelujah. I am a preacher, but more than that, I am a worshiper. First and utmost, I am a worshiper of the one true living God. I was born to do this. I was born to live like this. All mankind is 
It's just they don't find it. But we were given hands to clap, feet to dance before the Lord, a tongue to speak His wonderful name, a throat to sing the songs of Zion. We are at home tonight in the presence of the Almighty One, who is from ancient days, whose name is Jesus. He was known by many things in the Old Testament, but to us, His name is a name above every name. It is to this place tonight that we have come to give our allegiance anew and afresh, our credence to Him, for He is great, and He is greater to be praised, and of His kingdom there shall never be an end. That which we feel tonight is going to go on and on and on and on. This will never end. This will never end. And those of us who have Him shall never die. This water will forever spring up inside of us, a well of everlasting life. It will flow throughout the eons and the ages of eternity, for we have been to the water in His name. We have been to the fountain that shall never ever run dry. His name is wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of His government of peace, there shall be no end. He is mighty. the service of the Lord among us. We have praised Him for what He has done, but in the last few moments we have begun to worship. And there is a vast difference, because to praise Him is to thank Him for what He has done for you, but to worship Him is to bow down and acknowledge who He is, that He is the Lord of glory, that He is the Creator, and before Him there was none formed before Him, neither shall there be any formed after Him, as Isaiah said it. Isaiah was a worshiper. David was a worshiper. He went beyond the thank you stage and said, O thou that dwellest in the heavens, what is man that thou art mindful of him? He said of him, You who caused the clouds to float through the heavens, you who have done this and that and something else, he gave him credence. He elevated him to the place of supremacy, and he acknowledged him as God Almighty. The Syrophoenician woman addressed him, not rabbi, not master, but Lord. And when she said, Lord, help me, he really was saying, lady, you're going to get in before your time. This thing is designed for the Jews. I know it's going to go to you, but you're ahead of schedule. But I cannot deny you because you have dared to worship me. And when you worship me, lady, you're going to get exactly what you want. And she got it. What could that possibly mean for us tonight? It could mean this. I don't care if he said no in the past or whatever. You will most likely not get everything you want from God by whining or begging or pleading. But if you can find the grace in the face of every obstacle to begin to address him in his proper place and status, if you will lower yourself to the dust and exalt him to the heavens, I promise you the scepter will lower to you and that which he might not want to do will become yours. This Syrophoenician woman got it because worship is the prerequisite to the miraculous. If you want a miracle, the way to get it is to worship. You may not get it interceding or groaning or fasting, but you will get it when you begin to worship Him in spirit and in truth. For the Lord is mighty. He is mighty. The Lord who has made us is mighty. Mm. I believe I'm a word of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
People, through the years I have received criticism because I like the demonstration of the Spirit of God in power. I like nothing better than when everything is turned upside down and people are running and leaping and shouting for joy and blowing their noses and all of that business. I love it and I am convinced and fully persuaded that this man I represent, whose name is Jesus, also likes it. He also likes it. He likes it. That's it, boy. Just do your thing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People, people have said to me, Oh, Brother Stone King, you just get those people revved up and they do all this stuff. They're just dancing in their flesh. What else have you got to dance in? It is all that God gave us. What you see, friend, is what you got. He gave me feet. He gave me hands. He He gave me a body to house His Spirit. It's all I've got and I'm going to give it to Him. I'm going to give this to Him. I'm going to do it for Him. Yeah! Yeah! Of course it's flesh. Of course it's flesh. Of course it's flesh. But you keep picking them up and putting them down. It'll become spirit. It'll become spirit. It'll become spirit. Something happens. Away with such a philosophy from the face of the earth. We were born to do this. We were born to do it. Born to do it. (laughs) I'll tell you where you'll find God. I'll tell you where you'll find Jesus. He will charter a boat and float down the tear on your cheek. You'll find him in the raising of a hand. You'll find him in a song. You'll find him in a dance. You'll find him in singing and clapping. You'll find him there. I will be the first to admit to you This is not spirit. It's a hand raised. But if you raise it as unto the Lord, something begins to happen. Try it. Try it. Do you feel that? Do you feel that, Sister D's? Do you feel that? I will be the first to admit to you That is not spirit. It's two hands clapping. But you keep putting them together in the name of Jesus for his cause. Because you don't know what else to do for him. You just want to do something for him. Just want to do something for him. If you do it for him, something happens. Try it. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, all over this place. Just try putting your hands together. In the name of Jesus, for His cause, for His glory, something begins to happen in this place that transcends human logic and reasoning and understanding. Something begins to take place among us. Clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Triumph! Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh. Just go ahead and do your thing. Whatever it is, just do it for a minute. Here goes somebody running down the aisle. I hear somebody over here in a muffled scream. 
Somebody dancing in the aisle. There's somebody here bigger than us tonight. I feel the hand of His Majesty. Oh, Lord, my God, how great Thou art! I have heard some people say, I've heard some people say, I don't worship till I feel Him. <laughs> Let me tell you something, friend. You may never feel Him with an attitude like that. This doesn't make a difference if you feel Him or not. You may be unworthy. You may be a scoundrel and a rascal. And you may be justifiably, legalistically, politically unworthy. But do not forget this. No matter how unworthy you may be, He is forever worthy of your praise. For He is God. So go ahead and praise Him, you unworthy one. And you'll find His worthiness beginning to come off on you. You will find something beginning to transpire inside of you. Because to be in His presence is the fullness of joy. At His right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Forevermore! Do you hear me? Forevermore! The Bible specifically says to us, as the children of the Lord, that the Spirit of the Lord inhabiteth the praises of His people. Doesn't say stained glass, carpets, air conditioned sanctuaries, shacks, or whatever. It says His Spirit inhabits the praises of His people. Not the world, but His people. His people. His people. When they begin to praise and worship, we begin to build a habitation for the Lord to come. And when He comes into His habitation, anything can happen. So then, if we build a great big house of praise, He will come and live in that house in a great big way. He's here in this house of praise tonight, walking around, looking at you, looking at me, knowing your need. He is watching us. There was a king in the Old Testament that did an astronomical thing. An astronomical thing, by all sound reasoning and logic, Jehoshaphat facing the enemies of God. Going to battle. Read it for yourself in Second Chronicles chapter 20. Called for the singers. <laughs> he called for the choir. And whatever instruments that were portable to get out in front of the army and do their thing. What kind of military strategy is this? Where did this, in everyday common vernacular, jerk of a king learn to do such a thing as this? Do you know what a scoffing, mocking, miserable situation he must have become in the eyes of the enemy? They must have scorned and mocked him when they saw him putting the choir in front of the army rather than the archers and the spearmen. <laughs> and he said, sing, can you imagine, between two armies, there's a choir with a choir director. And the command was, sing, folks. Sing like you've never sung. And when they began to sing, there was something that began to move in the heavens. God was signaled. Angel 
angels were commanded and the host of the Lord of Almighty God began to come down from heaven and all of a sudden the enemy was discomfited and they were wiped out and the Bible says that the army of Jehoshaphat came back to Jerusalem with great joy. They were laughing and shouting and carrying on like a bunch of drunk people because they had never fired an arrow. They had never lifted a spear. Just singing and worship before their God had discomfited the enemy. What does that say to us tonight? I'll tell you what it says to us tonight. I don't care how many devils are on your trail. I don't care what Lucifer has sent to you. I don't care what message, how big the enemy is, how large the armies are. I couldn't care less. If we will go out before our battles with singing and with praising and with worshiping, he will discomfit the enemy. He will drive them back. He will take it away. We can worship our way out of any situation. We can worship our way out. You can praise your way out. What we ought to do is pick ourselves up and say, Satan, I may be in a fix, but I want you to hear this song I'm fixing to sing. I want you to see what I'm going to do in church. I'm going to run that aisle like I've never run that aisle. I'm going to do my thing for Jesus like I've never done my thing for Jesus. And I want you to stand there and watch it. There is nothing. There is nothing. There is no thing he can do in the presence of the saints of God who are worshiping their God because the Spirit of the Lord in heaven inhabit the praises of his people. He is inhabiting this. I feel him in this place tonight. <laughs> I like what I feel. I like it. I like it. I like it. Oh. Release your faith right now and believe the Lord for a touch. Angels can just swoop over this place and reach out and touch you right where you are standing. And suddenly you can be all right in the presence of the Lord. Jesus. Jesus, this is one of my favorite subjects, this business of worshiping and just going wild before the Lord. I have gone in Israel to watch the Israeli folk dancers. I want to tell you something. Dancing is a part of their culture. Those people have always carried on like that around campfires. The deserts of that area have for millennia heard the footfall and felt the reverberations of the feet of men, women, and children dancing beneath the stars and chanting unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We talk about shouting, and we mean dancing. Our terminology is so messed up sometimes. Shouting is not dancing. Shouting is shouting with the vocal cords, and dancing is dancing with the feet. And so they didn't shout. They danced. Before God, they just picked up whatever they wanted to pick up, one foot, two feet, whatever, three steps, one step backwards, and they did it un as unto the Lord. It was something they just wanted to do. They just had something going on inside of them. He'd done great things for them. And so they got out there in the desert and they just did their little thing for God. They're still doing it over there. They just get over there and do their thing. Here's a Jewish man right here from Brother Marion's church. Understand, he's a full-blooded, bona fide Jew. I got so thrilled watching him last night. He was carried away worshiping the Lord, and he couldn't really get with it. So he ripped his coat off, laid it down very nicely over here, and began to give it this. He just got into it like this. The coat was hindering him, so he took the coat off and just gave it all he had for God and fell out. 
I don't know if you're going to find a recipe any place for action like that, but I want to tell you what. It looked to me like God liked it because God blessed him. Out of his throat came words I could not understand. It was like the sound of a rushing mighty wind because God in heaven looks down upon a crowd like this and wants to get in every last one of us and do something for us he has never, ever done before. God wants to do something for you tonight he has never, ever done before. We need to lay down a lot of our traditions and our routines. We need to get involved with God like we've never been involved with him before. It's not going to hurt anything. Who cares what anybody says? There's nobody but us and Jesus here tonight. We don't apologize to anybody. I don't care what anybody thinks. We're a bunch of redeemed sinners. We're a bunch of redeemed sinners. We're on our way to heaven tonight. I was lost, but now I am found. I am newborn. I've got his royal blood inside of my veins. I've never been so happy. I've never been so fanatical. I've never been so thrilled in all of my life. And neither have you. This is the best thing we We've ever had a hold of. This is the best thing that's ever come to any of us. It's the best thing that's ever come to any one of us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I want to tell you something, friend of mine. This that you see going on here tonight, this, this worship that's going on here tonight, this is not Baptist. This is not Lutheran, what we're doing here. This is not Catholic. It's not Episcopalian. It's Jewish. It's Jewish. That's what it is. Because for 4,000 years, they had it. For 4,000 years, they were the only people that knew how to worship Him. Worship was designed for God and God alone. And the Jews knew how to do it. They did it with their feet. They did it with their hands. They gave Him their mouth. They gave Him their lips. They gave Him their throat. They gave Him everything they were, body, mind, and soul. And they got up there and did their thing and joined hands and danced around in circles. They just let it go. However, go! Those mountains echoed and re-echoed the chanting and the songs of the posterity of an old man called Abraham. Oh. Jewish. Jewish, this clapping, this shouting, this dancing, these tambourines, these organs, these pianos, it's Jewish. Oh. Ah. I prayed. I had the distinct pleasure it was for me of praying a Jewish man through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, about 27 years of age. His story is a long one. I will not belabor the point. But as a Jew raised in Orthodox Jewry, he could not find the reality of the God of the Old Testament. He could not find the power of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It drove him to the occult. He knew that was wrong because it was demonic. It drove him then to the forbidden book, the New Covenant, the New Testament. Reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he discovered and was convinced that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the Messiah that was promised to the posterity of Abraham. That led him to a survey, a circuit, experience of tampering and dabbling in every so-called Christian church that existed. He went to the Catholic church, but there were icons there. They were forbidden in the Old Testament to worship images or icons or idols of any kind. He knew that could not be it. So he left that and went to the Baptist church. Here they preached about Jesus. There was more of the reality of Jesus there. He liked it, but he could not find the demonstration of the Spirit he had read about in the book of Acts. That led him then to other churches. They did not have it. It finally led him to the Assembly of God church. But here they preached three gods. He knew that could not be right. For here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and Him only shalt thou serve. So... He left the Assembly of God Church, and he then came by 
God's divine providential care and plan to a United Pentecostal church. He came in, took one look at us running and shouting and dancing and heard the message preached on the oneness of God and he said, this is it, this is it, this is it. He was baptized in Jesus' name. I prayed him through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He fell backwards in my arms speaking with tongues. I said to him, now you're a Jew. You're a real Jew now, boy. You got the real thing. But his testimony to me is an enduring one. It will go to my grave with me as long as I have my mental faculties. This boy looked across me to me at a at a restaurant and he said, Brother Stoking, I want to tell you something. You people in the United Pentecostal Church, he said, you are nothing more or nothing less than ancient Judaism extended. He said, that's what you people are. He said, you got what we lost 2,000 years ago. He said, but you're the extension of what God of the Old Testament meant for the Jews to have. I never was so happy in all of my life. I always wanted to be a Jew anyhow. I love them. I've got a long nose. I can speak a little bit of their language. But I want to tell you something. I'm a bona fide, total, complete Jew tonight because I have the Jewish Messiah living inside of my heart. He is alive inside of me forevermore. I am a son of Abraham. I am a son of Abraham. We are sons and daughters of Abraham of old. Yeah. That's how they do it over there too. Just just sort of wild and crazy. <laughs> you know what we need, Pentecost? I'll tell you what we need. We need a real tear down. We ought to carry about half of you out of here drunk tonight on the spirit. Can't walk, can't talk. Just lay you someplace down to come to. We need a real Holy Ghost breakdown where the Spirit of God gets beyond where we are and takes us into a realm we've never been into before. I'm sick of church and I'm sick of camp meetings and I'm sick of everything. I want something to happen that has never ever happened before. I want to get a hold of him in a new way, in a new dimension that I've never ever had before. Brother Barnes, there is something here tonight that is from ancient days. There is something here tonight from ancient days that wants to reach out and touch us as we've never been touched before. You cannot be the same after this camp meeting. Pentecostal, it is now or never for us. It's now or never never for us. We're either going to get this thing together now or we're never going to get it together ever. You people here have got it together. You've got everything going for you. Something ought to break loose at this camp meeting that would extend to every part of this country. Something ought to happen here this week that would go from these borders to every part of the country. There's hunger in the land. There's revival in the north. But something needs to happen somewhere. A fire needs to explode somewhere. We need to become fanaticals and just simply go wild with this. You've got it. 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 We've got it. We've all got it. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there was a prophet whose name was Elisha, a double portion of Elijah's spirit. He was called upon in Second Kings chapter 3 to prophesy and he could not. That's amazing to me. He couldn't with a double portion of Elijah's spirit. He said, bring me a minstrel. Bring me a little worship. Bring somebody to me that can stir up the gift that's in me, and then I'll tell you what thus saith the Lord. That's exactly what he was doing. 
He knew how to work with the Spirit. A lot of us don't. He did. He said, bring me somebody to sing and to worship. And they brought a minstrel in and began to play. And when that minstrel began to play, the gift inside of him began to move. And he was able to open his mouth and say, what thus saith the Lord. You know why a lot of preachers don't preach any better than they do? Because saints don't worship. And that's excellent preaching. I used to tell my people when I preach, listen, do something. If you're too tired, you may have had a bad day. But if you do something, just do something when you come to church. Please do something. Prop your elbow up on the back of the pew. Just wave your hand a little bit, even as you're falling asleep. But do something when you come to the house of God. Do something. Anything is better than nothing. I do not understand people who come to the house of God, who say they have the Holy Ghost, and sit there like a frog caught in a snowstorm in the middle of February. I do not understand people who come to the house of God that never at least have a finger or a foot. If you've got the Holy Ghost, and you say you do, if He is alive inside of you, and you come into the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and He begins to move and choirs begin to sing, something ought to move you. Something ought to move you. I preach in lots of home missionary churches so that I can see, you know, the crowds aren't very big sometimes, and I can see every visitor that comes in. It is amusing to me. It is amazing to me. Have do your thing, boy. That's great. Let's clap with him for just a moment. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> I try to He's the picking them up and putting them down, that one. It's a long ways around there. <laughs> Let's clap again and worship the Lord. There's nobody here but us. And so we worship you, O Holy Father. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. I watch people who come to visit our services. I watch people who have never been in a Pentecostal service before. And at first they will scowl, especially if there's any kind of a major demonstration. Because a lot of it is just fear. They don't know what's going on. They've never seen anyone act like us, at least not in church. And I have watched people, and I get to looking at them without me being conspicuous. I'll scoot around to see what they're doing when the singing is really going. And if I can spot a foot going like this... We've already got you, friend. It's only just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Because that is involved with that. And when that gets involved with that, that gets involved with this, and this gets involved with this, and you get converted. <laughs> you get converted in the end result. I have watched them scowl at us. And with their fingers tap a songbook that was closed on their laps. I have just grinned and thought, lady, it's only a matter of time. Just a matter of time. I have watched Jews in old Israel, in Jerusalem and Tiberias. I've watched those Jews come in those synagogues and I've gone to them. And they get to doing all this and carry it on like this and good, all this stuff. And I like to watch it because I feel connected with them somehow. I feel like I belong to all of that. I feel like when I go to Israel, I have come home. I don't understand it, but I feel that way when I go there. And I've watched these Jews do all this thing. They call it davening, don't they? Davening. And they get to doing all of this business, all this business. I ask a guide one day and I ask my bus driver, what is all this business? What are they doing in there? And they looked at me and said, we don't know what, why we do that. But we all do it. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, it is impossible to worship the one true God and not become involved with Him physically. 
friend of mine, there's no way, there is no way you can worship the one true God and not become involved with Him physically. Something will happen to you if you worship the one true God. You will get involved with Him somehow. You will get involved. You will cry. You will shed a tear. You will shout. You will clap your hands. You will run. You will lift your hands. You will do something physically if you worship the one true God. Mm. Mm. I watched a Jewish boy one day in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, had a prayer shawl on and a, and a yarmulke. I watched him out of the corner of my eye. I was reading a Time magazine. The place was packed with people waiting to catch flights. He was over here against the wall going like this. I could hear him chanting in Hebrew. It was his time to pray and he was praying. I've never felt so much conviction in my life. I thought, God, if he is willing to do that in a public place because it is his appointed time to pray, what should I be doing as a oneness apostolic Pentecostal? Where am I in all of this anyhow? Where am I? Sometimes I wonder about myself. I see them do all of those things. And we say, I know Him. I know Him. And some of us won't even pray a prayer at a restaurant over a meal. Here is a Jewish boy gone like this in front of hundreds of people. He doesn't have the Messiah. I do. I want you to hear me tonight. There are millions who save to Buddhism who sit cross-legged and chant before gold statues with eyes that see not and ears that hear not, hands that touch not, feet that walk not. David said, those that worship them are like unto them, dumb, dead. But they worship like this for hours, and they meditate. Head to the ground, three to five times a day, chanting, Allah is God, and Muhammad is his prophet. They'll do it in Jerusalem while you stand and watch them. They don't make any apologies to you. They don't care if you understand, don't understand, like it or don't like it. When it is their time to pray, they are dedicated and they're at it. I went into my living room one day after I had studied a Time Life magazine book that came to me on the great religions of the world. I said, Jesus, you and I both know here today that you are the only true God. And if there are millions doing those things for statues, I'm going to do the things they do for statues unto you. And I began to sway like this and say, Jesus of Nazareth, I worship you because you are the one true God. There is none like unto thee, neither in heaven nor in earth. I know not any. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. Friend of mine, I'm not exaggerating, Sister Vesta Mangan. I could hear the sandaled footfall of the man from Galilee walk across the living room floor. He came into my living room. I had a touch of God on me like God never had before. Let me tell you something. Sometimes I think we're in a rut. We have sung, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me until we have wrung the last drop of blessing there is in it out. When I was in Bible school, we sang it Thursday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and every day in chapel. I can't hardly stand to hear it sung. We need to do what David said. He said, I'll sing a new song unto the Lord. If we don't hear it someplace, we'll make up one. We're just going to sing something different to God. I'm glad Jesus lifted me. I'd rather sing something else now. We've sung the same songs until nobody gets blessed anymore. It's just a ritual. 
It wouldn't hurt us to do a little swaying in church. Charismatic! That's what you're going to hear. That's it. I want to tell you something. They're not charismatics. We're charismatics. We're the real ones. We are the real ones. We are the classical Pentecostals. We are those from ancient days. We are the ones that have a right to sway. Because we're living it. <laughs> We've been to the water in his name. I got his spirit. I know who he is. And I got a right to sway. I got a right to sway. If the Muslims can do it, I can do it. If the Buddhists can do it, I can do it. It wouldn't hurt us to get involved with something different. It wouldn't hurt you to try something different. I used to tell my people, if you don't feel anything, fall out of the chair on the floor. Let's have a little action. We have come here to do something for Jesus. Right or wrong, we're going to do it. We need to do something different for Him. Hmm. We have allowed people, other groups, to get into areas. We have backed off and they have cheated us out of the blessing. They have adulterated it, dragged it back to the pits. And we should have taken it and run with it and shown them really how to do it. God is trying to speak to us in this hour to loosen us into a realm that we have never ever been in before. God wants us to return to the ancient paths. He wants us to become involved with the real genuine touch of God and the real demonstration of the Holy Ghost. There is a tremendous move of the Spirit in this place tonight. There is something here that is beginning to break loose. There is something here that is beginning to give. You can feel it. You can feel it. You people really really want to jump off the cliff. You really want to get into all the areas that you've heard preached about. Why not tonight? Did you hear these signs? Revival of not now when? Revival of not now where? Revival of not us who? Nobody. Nowhere. Never. It's going to have to be with us tonight in this place. Something needs to go out of here that will turn everything around. People, we've not come to just another camp meeting. We've come to a place of destiny, a point of destiny. We have come to something that is different from any other place we've ever been before. There's something different about this campground. There's something different about you people. There's something different about these preachers. There's something different about all of us because we have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. If we don't do it. Nobody else is going to do it. We're going to have to carry the banner and blaze the trail and let it go like we have never let it go before. I just came, I just came up a couple of months ago from Seattle, Washington. I don't know how, I forgot, lost track of time. I go so many places and get off so many planes, I lose track of time. But I was in Seattle, Washington, not too long ago. On a Sunday night in Brother Denny's church, he's a former missionary to uh, the Philippines, we had a move of God unlike anything I have ever seen any place in the world. It began with worship, and there was no stopping it. I watched young men sit cross-legged on the floor and sing in the Spirit with their hands raised for over an hour. Young people ministered to each other. People were crying. People were embracing. I watched teenagers just lie on the floor and turn over and just groan and pass out in trances. People sang in the Spirit. God wants to get into our vocal cords. He wants to do something through us like the sound of many babbling brooks, like the sound of rushing cool wind. He wants to flow over us in the new demonstration of spirit and worship.
We've got a degree in all of this. We're the greatest worshipers in the world that I don't know anything about. But we need to get a doctrine in this. There's a doctrine you can get into. There's a place that you can ascend to that is beyond what we have already known. It's beyond. I'm convinced because of my living room floor and all of this business I did one day. I'm convinced there's an area in this that we have never tapped. There is something that God would do for us if we would just loosen ourselves and enter into his gates with praise and thanksgiving. If we would come through the doors leaping and shouting. If we would come, if we would come to give and not to get. Brother Denny stood at the end of that service and he said, I've seen lots of things in the Philippines, but I have never seen anything like this. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yes. Hearken unto our voice. Loose us and let us go. Loose us and let us go. I feel to tell you something. I must get across to you tonight how important this is. I'm beginning to come to a close. I preached for a man in Twin Falls, Idaho, Brother Picklesheimer. He's got a tremendous church. I go there just every once in a while when I can. He's got worshipers. I never saw a bunch like he's got. He's got a young married men, and they got tambourines, and they just dance and do their thing all around the building, whether there's anything moving or not. They just do it. And uh, it gets you involved, you know. And so they were just doing their thing. One Sunday night I preached on worship. Started at 6 o'clock. They were still there at 1130 at night. Running, dancing, shouting. I never saw quite anything like it. It was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. To make a long story short, at the end of the service, the wives of those young married men had to go home because the babies were asleep and all of that. And so they left. It left these young married men free to go out after church. Finally, the thing settled down without me giving you all the minute details. And there was this one group, Scott Collins. What a worshiper he is. He must be like King David in the Old Testament. I've never seen anybody worship the way he worshiped with a tambourine. He is the epitome of worship as far as I'm concerned. Any place I've ever seen in the world. Scott and four of those other young men... He decided to go to the pizza hut after service. And Scott kept the tambourine in his hand. He got out of the car. And these five married young men walked into the entrance of the pizza hut. And when they got in the entrance of the pizza hut, the Spirit of God, they were full of the Holy Ghost. They've been in church five and a half hours doing this. He raised that tambourine and began the jingle. And when he did, the Holy Ghost fell on him. And those young men went leaping into that pizza hut. They went leaping into that pizza hut, shouting and dancing before the Lord. You talk about bringing things to a screeching halt. I want you to know there were forks that fell to the table. You could hear the clatter of silverware and dishes. You could hear people were just staring. Nobody believed it. And the manager of that place came running. He said, what is this? Scott said, oh, we've just come from Pentecostal revival. There was a man healed of cancer who walked out without it. There were people who received the Holy Ghost. Young people were blessed by God. You know what happened? I'll tell you what happened. Because of worship that was extended beyond the four walls. That manager, that pizza hut, reached his arms emotionally to those five young men and said, this is what I need. This is what I need. This 
I need. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Let's clap with those back there dancing in the corner in the aisle. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. I watched in Seattle, Washington, a girl who had dropped a big dish in the sink. The dish had broken and part of it had gone, the sharp edge had gone through her wrist and had severed all the nerves in her wrist. The doctor said, we can't help you because the nerves have been severed. Her fingers, her hands were bandaged. Ruth Ann Kerr right there from New Orleans was in that service and you watched what happened in the service where the worship was so great. I watched that girl reach up and unband that wrist and that hand. These two fingers were paralyzed. The doctor said there'll be no feeling in them. She began to take her hands like this in the presence of people who were worshiping in this habitation of praise that was built by the people of God. She began to go like this. I walked to her and began to stroke those fingers in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden she opened her eyes crying. She said, Brother Stoking, I can feel. She said, I can feel. You know why she could feel? I know the one that can put the nerves back together. I know the one that can put the nerves back together. I I know the one who can do it. And I'll tell you when he'll do it. He'll lower the scepter when the house of God builds a habitation of praise for him. There are miracles here tonight. There are signs, wonders, and miracles here tonight. It is all contingent upon the worship of the people of God. Angels are waiting to be dispatched among you. In that singles conference in Seattle, Washington, there was a young girl who had had a brain tumor. The doctors had cut as much of it as they could out. They could not get all of it. They carried her to church on Thursday night. I was telling you, Brother Barnes, about this. They carried this girl to church. She could not think straight. We prayed for her on Thursday night. Her thinking returned. We prayed again Friday morning at the morning service. Her memory returned. And that night, she was dancing in the aisle from the back to the front. God removed all the doctors could not get. It is born out of worship. Miraculous, miraculous things are contingent upon the worship of the people of God. I tell you tonight that worship is the prerequisite to the miraculous. It is the prerequisite to the miraculous. I've had a big time with you tonight, and some of you have had a big time. And we go home from here, we'll say we had a big time. But my closing remark to you is this. I know something maybe you've never thought about before. We think about how to, what a big time we had in church. But I can tell you that Jesus is having a big time here. He's been down here running in the aisles with some of you. He's been out here dancing with some of you. He's been out here worshiping with some of you. He's been jumping up and down with some of you. Because Jesus likes this. He likes this. He just simply likes what's going on in this place. Do you understand it? God is having a big time among His people tonight because His people have loosened themselves and entered into His courts with praise and with thanksgiving. Why don't you wave a hand? Why don't you shout a voice? Why don't you sway? Why don't you bow to His sovereignty? Why don't you worship His dignity and His holiness? Why don't you just do your thing for Jesus? In the name of the Lord, it's a new day, people. It's a new day. Tommy, it's a new day. It's a new day. You know what I'm talking about, boy. You know what I'm talking about. It's a new day. It's a new day where we've never been before.